Welcome, welcome to Glad Tidings this lovely Sunday morning. Uh, would you all stand with me as I have a reading from the Word of God this morning? We are all on this uh, great and wonderful journey called life. The scary part, however, is we don't always know what the future holds for us. That's one of the reasons why we're here this morning, to seek God's guidance and God's wisdom. In Romans, which I'll be reading shortly, it reveals to us that we have a God that is like no other. His ways are beyond anything that we can imagine, and we are to find peace and comfort in that fact. Scripture says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. Father God, we just come to you this morning giving you praise, Lord, and we just invite you into our presence and just ask that you move in our lives in a mighty way. Truly, Lord, we ask for wisdom from you and knowledge and just lead us in every step that we should take. And so, Lord, may we just honor you with our very best this morning as we just shout out and give you praise. To you, Lord, be the glory forever. Amen.
in praise. Yes, we praise you, Lord. You are the one and only true and living God. And we worship you today, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you came and you died on the cross for us. We worship you. Jesus Christ.
are going to um, take the next five minutes as we always do in our service. Let me encourage you uh, as many as can and will to come toward the front. We actually took the row out in the front so there's a little more room, a little more space um, for those who would like to come. There are names of lost loved ones and family members and friends in the jars that we are praying specifically for. I encourage you to take some of those names and pray for them. Needs on the screen. If you have a special need, we will have all the workers that will pray with you. So can we just come at this time, as many as would like and can, I encourage you to come. The rest of you just pray in your seat, stand, walk, however you like for the next five minutes. Let's seek the Lord together.
Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to pray to seek you. And God, thank you that you hear our request. Thank you that because of Jesus, we have access to you. And Father, we can be confident that you've heard our prayers. And God, because of your great love for us, why wouldn't you answer us? Why wouldn't you do what would uh, bring, bring great glory to your name? Based on your beneficence, God, we ask that you would uh, make our prayers heard and answered today in such a way, God, that the evidence would be beyond all doubt that we would see your hand <clears throat> upon our lives. We pray this morning, Father, for uh, Ron Shreves. Lord, as he's struggling with the spinal meningitis, we ask God that you would strengthen his body and Lord, you would just put everything back in order. We ask God that you would strengthen him and his family with him, Lord, that they would all take courage from your presence and your peace. We pray today for Steve and Cheryl Freeman, Lord, as they grieve the loss of their son, we ask God that you would strengthen them and help them, God, in their time of grief and loss. Uh, God, that they would be able to look to you and know your comfort and your strength. And God, we pray also for Jim Floyd, whose uh, D is now in the nursing home care. We ask God that you would make her a light in that place as well. She has been all these years in this church. We pray, God, thank you for her faithfulness. It's a reflection of your faithfulness. And so we pray, God, that you would strengthen her and give her your peace and your presence in her room. And that she would know, God, that you are very present. And those who know her and those, Lord, who would meet her in that nursing home would know your presence with her. Lord, we ask also for your presence today in our service as we continue. We ask, God, that you would speak truths that would change our lives and help us to understand you in a way that we didn't before. We pray for the city of Muncie, Father God, that your salvation would come. And God, you would be more famous and followed in this city. We pray for the salvation of our loved ones and those, Lord, who are neighbors and friends and co-workers. We ask, God, that you would help us to have the boldness to speak to them these truths that we hear. And God, we would take those out and share them with others in a way that they would come to know you too. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this uh, service. your guests we would love for you to do the same and if you don't mind giving us your contact information we would um, love to send you a gift card just as a small thank you for being with us today and all of those cards can be left on the chairs we'll pick those up after service we want to thank you for your very faithful and generous giving we have many ways that you can do that we have um, electronic ways that you can set to just automatically come out on dates and for the amounts that you set or you can give electronically and you go in and hit send each time. Uh, we also have in-person giving of course and we do have some offering envelopes in the bulletins that you'll also find on your rows. And then um, if you give with cash or check, we have containers in the back of the sanctuary. So we um, thank you for that. Um, we've had many, many newcomers over the last several months and um, right now, because of how 2020 was, we consider newcomers even those of you who came in 2019 because we didn't get to have our, our welcome dinner and our core that helps get our um, newer people assimilated and connected to others. And so we are having a welcome dinner this Saturday. We have many people signed up. If you're going to come, we would love for you to do that. We do need to um, know by um, you signing up at the Welcome Center. So if you don't mind going there at the end of service and letting us know, um, we have child care for younger children. We'll feed the entire family. It's just a great opportunity for the staff to get to spend time with you, for you to get to know other newcomers and learn all of um, about the ministries that Glad Tidings offers. I want to mention to those of you who have fifth through 12th graders, there's a couple events coming up. So the details in your bulletin um, or you can find the details in your bulletin and um, make sure you get signed up and get those on your calendar. And then um, we're very excited that our Hartford City campus, our second church plant, 
um, is meeting in their permanent facility right on a State Road 3. And um, we want to make sure that you get to go see the beautiful facility. We want to um, thank our volunteers that have spent a lot of time helping um, get that ready. And so there's going to be an open house on March 19th. That's a Friday from 4 to 8. And so that's open to the community there. You're more than welcome and encouraged to attend. And why not take this opportunity, if you know someone who lives in that area that does not attend church, invite them um, to meet you and, and go to that open house. What a great opportunity. I know in a town that size, everyone's probably really excited about uh, a new church, a new um, facility. And so what a great opportunity for you to reach out to someone who um, currently is an attending church. And we hope that you all um, will take this opportunity.
you. Beautiful job. I have a, uh, a great friend who uh, pastors uh, really probably maybe the greatest uh, church in our fellowship here in Indiana, uh, size and strength, and um, his name is Wayne Murray, and Wayne pastors in Greenwood at Grace Assembly. And uh, he texted me a few weeks ago and followed that up with a phone call and said, we have a young lady in our congregation uh, who has been to the Congo, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and is going to go back. And uh, her name is Sarah Nelson. And he said, you are gonna want to have her at Glad Tidings and you're gonna want to support her. So he sent me her video and um, we have already begun supporting her. Uh, you are really going to um, enjoy her sharing what God is doing in her life. She is from Greenwood. Uh, she is 23 years old and she's been a part of Grace Assembly since 2012. Uh, she has served already nine months uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo with the Assemblies of God World Missions, uh, part of the Engage program. Um, her story of how God has raised her up and changed her life and her family's life, uh, changed there at Grace Assembly is a great story. She graduated in 2020 uh, from Southwestern Assemblies of God University in Waxahachie, Texas, am I right? All right, and um, she currently works with teenagers in group homes at the Indiana Methodist Children's Home. She's gonna be leaving soon as a missionary associate uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She's gonna minister there to youth and uh, she'll have a two year appointment. And Sarah, it's a good thing you're young because we have worked you out this morning. She started over there and then we hurried her up across the parking lot in the rain. And here she is to share with us for a few moments. Would you give Sarah Nelson a great big warm welcome. Bonjour mes amis, comment vous allez? Je suis content de vous voir. Hello my friends, how are you? I'm happy to see you. This is a general greeting used at the beginning of every school day in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's also one of the first phrases that I learned to be, like I was able to say when I began speaking French and serving in this amazing country. So, like Pastor Kevin said, my name is Sarah Nelson. I'm 23 years old. Uh, during my second year of college, I served in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I'll refer to as Congo, because that's a lot of words. <laughs> um, I served in the Democratic Republic of Congo for nine months during my second year of college. But before I get into anything else, I just want to say a huge thank you first to Pastor Kevin. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and to speak, not only to your adults, but to your kids and your teenagers. It just blesses my heart so much. And thank you, Glad Tidings, for giving me your ear this morning. And thank you for your giving to missions and your support of missionaries. It means so much to me. So the DRC, Congo, is located in Central Africa, for those of you guys who don't know. It's actually located right in the middle of Africa, dubbing it the heart of Africa, which I love that illustration. So while I was there, like Pastor Kevin said, I got to do a lot of stuff, but predominantly I worked with teenagers in the churches there, in what we would call youth ministries, but I'll get to that later. And I got to do a lot of other things, like learn French which was very challenging. <laughs> I got to learn the Congolese culture. I relearned a lot of the stuff that, you know, just comes so naturally to us here, right? I learned how to wash my clothes in a bucket. <laughs> I learned how to take a bath out of that same bucket. <laughs> I learned so much stuff. And can I tell you guys, I fell in love. I fell in love with every part. I fell in love with the work. I fell in love with the youth, the teenagers, their families. I fell in love with even the hot weather, all of that. But more than anything, I fell in love with the fact that God was calling me to serve these amazing people in this amazing country. So as Pastor Kevin said, I'm going back to the Democratic Republic of Congo very, very soon for two years to serve as a missionary associate. And I'm super excited to do all of this. So now, why did I start out talking in French? And why did I start talking about the beginning of school days in Congo? The French was not because I'm super great at French, because let's be honest, guys, any of you, does anybody speak a second language in here? It's ridiculous, okay? You're mixing words. It's horrible sometimes, okay, guys? It's rough. So it was not to show off my French, but it was because of this. The youth of Congo, the teenagers of Congo, they have my heart. There are 88 million people that live in Congo, and over half of those people are underneath the age of 18. 
So half the population of Congo is underneath the age of 18. That's insane. But the problem is, is that most of the efforts of the Congolese churches are towards the little kids and then the mamas and the papas, the adults. And very little, if anything, exists for the ages of 11 to 18 years old, what we would normally consider youth ministry. Another really important thing to know about Congo youth ministry is that you're not out of youth ministry until you're married. <laughs> so I'm 23 and I'm still a youth in Congo technically, which makes it kind of awkward in youth services. Because I remember the first time I went to a youth service in Congo, it was an 11 year old girl on one side of me, 20 year old Sarah, and 32 year old man on the other side of me. We were talking about dating. Could you imagine we can quickly see how this type of discipleship is not only dangerous, it's ultimately ineffective. And we don't have a missionary serving this age group in Congo. I don't even know if we've ever had a missionary from AGWM serving this age group in Congo. So that's where I come in. That is where I come in. I get to go back and I get to work with teenagers. And while I'm there, while I'm working with youth, I'm gonna be developing programs for them so when they come to church, they can actually learn at their level in the age groups that they need to be able to be mentored so that they can become lifelong followers of Jesus. More than that, I'm gonna be working with their families, building relationships in their homes, because wherever you see one teenager in Congo, there's like six to eight more kids at home. That's just the reality of life there. So I'm going to be building relationships. And the most exciting thing that I get to do is I get to come alongside of youth workers who are already on the ground doing stuff. They're not, there's not many, but there are some that are doing things that have youth ministry. And I get to help them do what they do better. I get to support them. I get to come alongside of them and say, what do you need and how can I be of assistance to you? I get to come alongside senior pastors who don't have youth ministries in their churches and talk to them about why an effective youth ministry is so essential to their community. And then I get to help them create one. And I'm really excited to do all of this because I believe that it's what Congo needs. And I believe it's what the youth of Congo need. But there is one thing that I need. And I'm going to take you to a moment in Congo that I love, one of my favorite moments to illustrate what it is that I need. So imagine with me, I'm walking down a dirt road. I have one of my really good friends, her name's Deborah. she's Congolese. We're walking down this dirt road and it's just chaos. There's tons of people walking by, it's a lot, there's a lot going on. And to the left of me, there are some mamas at a stand selling like beignets and bottled drinks and stuff like that. Up ahead of me, there's some men on motorcycles and they're waiting for people who need rides places. That's their job, so they wait and then when somebody needs a ride, they like hail the moto and then they're like, okay, and so they take them to where they need to go. So they're up there, probably like five of them. And then to the right of me, there are some little toddlers yelling out, Mzungu, Mzungu, which means white person, white person, AKA me, because I stick out like a sore thumb when I'm there. <laughs> Um, and then still behind me, guys, there was like the biggest game of pickup soccer I had literally ever seen. At least 25 kids per team, makeshift ball, makeshift net, like the whole nine yards, the real deal. It was insane. There was so much going on. And I just remember even thinking like, oh my gosh, like so much to pull your attention, so much noise. And I remember stopping in the middle of the street and thinking to myself, wow, there's so much life, so much love, so much community. I stopped my friend, and I was like, look, I guard. And she's like, look at what, Sarah? And I'm like, this, community. I've gotten it wrong for so long, but Africa is teaching me how to get it right again. So church, that's what I need in order to go back to Congo. I need a community of people committed to seeing every nation be reached for the gospel of Christ. A community of people dedicated to the Great Commission, a community of people willing to pray and willing to give and willing to go, a community of people that are trying to make a bigger impact in the kingdom of God. So I am a woman of action. I love next steps. I love action steps. So I'm going to challenge you, church, to do two things today. The first challenge that I have for you today is to ask the Holy Spirit, each one of you, what am I doing for the Great Commission and can I do more? Can I do more? It's important to ask this question because it's not something that God's just going to drop in our lap. Because ain't nobody want to give. Nobody wants to spend time in prayer. Nobody really wants to give our money, right? But we have to ask the Holy Spirit. And then when he speaks to us, we have to do it. We have to obey what he says. 
So some of you today, when you start asking the Holy Spirit what you need to do for the Great Commission, he's going to start placing people groups on your heart that you can't even pronounce, and he's going to ask you to pray for them. Do it. He's going to ask you to pray for missionaries by name. Do it. He's going to ask you, some of you, to start giving to missions regularly through your church. Do it. Some of you that already give to missions, he's going to ask you to give more. Do it. Because church, when we decide to invest our time and prayer and our financial resources into the kingdom of God, we're investing directly to see souls be saved for the gospel of Christ. And that's the most important thing. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So that's my first challenge to you guys today. My second challenge for you guys today is for those of you who are called to missions. I always say my favorite way for you to join me is by joining me. Like coming to Africa, being a missionary. So if you are called to missions, maybe you're a young person like myself, and you're like, I don't know what that looks like, and I don't know what the next step is, and that's scary to me. It, 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 that never changes. <laughs> it never changes. It's still scary to me some days. And sometimes I still don't know what the next step is. But I challenge you to take the next step. And your next step today is going to be coming and talking to me after service. So I can put resources in your hands and give you my phone number so that when you decide to follow the call of God on your life, that you actually have a friend to help you walk through it, because I needed that when I started. Or maybe you're sitting here today, and you were called to missions 20 years ago. And now you have three kids and a career, and you're like, maybe God just didn't call me. Can I challenge you to ask him again? Ask him again, because church, you're never going to feel truly fulfilled in your life until you're walking out the call that God's designed specifically for you. Amen? Okay, guys, so those are my calls to you. Ask the Holy Spirit, should I give? Should I pray? Should I go? And can I tell you? The answer is yes. Pray. Give. Go. Be a part. Join the community of people dedicated to reaching every single nation for the gospel of Christ. Thank you so much for letting me come speak to you today. I'm excited to meet you guys after service. I get to preach after that. How about that? Sarah, if you, uh, where'd she run off to? Is she, oh, right there. If you change your mind about the Congo, we'll hire you here, okay? <laughs> we'd be glad to have you. Stand with me if you would. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Listen, on the chairs are envelopes um, beyond what we normally place on the chair. There's an envelope that is marked missions. I know many of you are going to want to be a blessing to Sarah and um, to the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can give an offering. You can place it in the boxes uh, on your way out. And uh, let's be a blessing to her. Give generously. Uh, I think we all can sense God is going to use her in a very unique and very special way. Luke chapter 16 is where I want to read this morning. And also we're going to read this one verse that's on the screen from Hebrews 9, 27. This was the verse that we used kind of as our jump off point last week. Uh, when I began this four-week series, we're talking about eternal, um, eternal judgment, heaven and hell. It's not a series that is often preached, not one that I've preached a lot about, but certainly one that needs to be heard uh, today. So in Hebrews 9, 27, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And then look with me in Luke chapter 16, and we read these words of Jesus beginning in verse number 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was when the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom or to paradise, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. 
and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Holy Spirit, uh, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. And Lord, we take just a moment and we pray for Sarah. We ask God that you would supernaturally bless her and anoint her even beyond, God, what you have already done. Lord, we can sense that you are going to use her to make a difference in the young people in Congo. We pray, God, your protection upon her. We pray that you would meet every need. And, God, that you would just expedite the process for her to get there so that she can begin sharing the gospel of Jesus with those young people who need to know about you. And, Father, I pray in these next few minutes as we look to your word that, Lord, you would anoint me not because uh, I somehow have deserved or earned that anointing, but because, Lord, I recognize that without it, I cannot rightly divide and communicate your word. So would you use me, help me to speak not a single word of my own, but only that which is from you. And I pray, Lord, that you would captivate the attention of everyone in this place today. We know this is a message that is somber. It is a message that is sacred. It is a message, Lord, that is profound in how it captivates and calls and convicts and challenges us. So I pray, Lord, that you would do just that and that we would all hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us in these moments that we share together. May we approach your word with a sense of, that this is a sacred and holy moment as we hear you speak to our hearts. We thank you for that. Challenge us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to someone and greet them or wave at them across the way and welcome one another to Glad Tidings this morning, if you would. So last week, uh, we began this four-part series on eternal judgment with a special and kind of laser focus on heaven and hell. As I shared with you last week, this whole subject of eternal judgment is a somewhat controversial subject in the church today. It is a doctrine that sadly is often mocked, it is often scorned, It is often written off as something that is archaic and no longer for us today. Yet the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 that I read to you at the outset makes it very clear we all have an appointment with death. And after that appointment with death, the writer of Hebrews says, then comes the judgment. As we learned last week, issues of eternity and reminders of eternal judgment have all but slipped off the radar of the church world today. Many of us grew up with heaven and hell being subjects that we heard about often. We sang about them often, but because of certainly the worldliness of our culture and the internal focus of the church where everything has become about living a better life now, we have almost completely put away the idea of eternity and what that looks like for us. And because of that, that, we have devalued the importance of being accountable, 
We've certainly devalued the importance of evangelism and missions, as Sarah has shared, and certainly there has been a devaluing of the pursuit of holiness. Peter writes that everyone who has this hope of Christ's return will purify himself even as he is pure, but if we lay aside the hope of Christ's return and what happens after death, and we forget that and we only live about the here and now, before long, the pursuit of holiness is not something that drives us. Last week, I talked about why judgment, eternal judgment, is necessary. And I share with you four reasons. Number one, the divine necessity for eternal judgment is because of the immutability of God's word. That is, his word does not change. It cannot mutate. The writer of Hebrews makes it very clear that it is God who is speaking that one either receives or refuses. And because God's word cannot change, and because God has promised eternal judgment, divine and eternal judgment is necessary because of the unchangeableness or the immutability of his word. Secondly, we talked about the holy character of God. Divine judgment, eternal judgment is necessary because God is a holy God. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And to enter the presence of God, we must stand in the righteousness of Jesus. Habakkuk talks about the pure eyes of God and that he cannot look on evil. The holy character of God makes eternal judgment divinely necessary. Number three, we talked about the absolute justice of God requires that eternal judgment follow death. In Hebrews 12, 25, the writer says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, that's when God spoke through Moses on earth to the wilderness generation, if they did not escape, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? Because God is just, and because God judged those who refused to listen to the voice of God when Moses spoke to them on earth, how much more if we reject the salvation offered in Jesus Christ? God is a just God, and he must judge because of his justice. And finally, divine necessity for eternal judgment is a reality because of the gracious promise of God. The writer of Hebrews says, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, so let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. He's given us this gracious opportunity, and if we reject that gracious opportunity to draw near, we cannot help but experience judgment. In this series, over the next three weeks, I want to discuss the outcomes of divine judgment. In two weeks, two weeks from today, I'm going to talk about specifically heaven. Next week, I'm going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ, which is a judgment for all believers. Everyone who is at the judgment seat of Christ will ultimately go to heaven, but it will not be a party at the judgment seat of Christ. Our motives will be judged. Our actions, what we did and we did not do, those things will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll talk about that next week. But today, um, I have the rather somber task of talking about hell, the eternal judgment of the wicked, a subject that it seems like we don't talk about at all any longer, and yet it is crucial to the gospel message. As I begin to talk about hell, let me talk about some extremes that we would want to avoid. There are some that absolutely are thrilled with the idea of graphic descriptions of the flames of hell and the torment of the doomed and the damned. And certainly that must not be our entire message, but on the other end of that spectrum, there are those that want to avoid it altogether. They don't want to talk about the reality of hell. One of the things that I came to realize as I was preparing this message is that this is a message that's difficult for me to preach. It's difficult for me because I've pastored now for 36 years. And the reality is that if God's word is true, and I know that it is, I have preached to people. I have pastored people who chose to reject Jesus Christ and have now passed on to eternity and are today experiencing the judgment of eternal hell. That's a hard reality. It's a hard reality to know that I will still preach to people 
who will hear the message of the gospel and who will reject that message and who will spend eternity in hell. It is not a message that is fun or enjoyable to discuss, but we must be true to God's word. What God says about heaven, what God says about hell, we too should say. Let me share with you some statistics that you would want to consider. I'm surprised by this, but 89% of Americans, when polled, believe that there is a heaven. 73%, I was totally shocked by that, of Americans believe that there is a hell. Surprisingly, that group has gone up in the last 20 years from between 50 and 55%. Now, 73% of Americans believe that there is a hell. However, when those same people are asked, if they would go to heaven or hell, 76% of those people say they would go to heaven. Only 2% say they would go to hell. 4% say they would go to purgatory. 12% somewhere else and 6% don't know or refuse to answer. The discrepancy is certainly hard to reconcile with the words of Jesus. Jesus gives only two alternatives. Look at the words of Jesus. These are red letter words. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus makes it clear there are but two choices. Two options, there is a road that leads to eternal destruction and one that leads to eternal life. So let me share with you three issues. They're all very simple. I won't be lengthy this morning. But three issues about hell. Number one is the reality of hell. It is clear that Jesus believed in hell. As a matter of fact, Jesus talked more about hell by far you can look it up yourself, than he did about heaven. He warned people of the danger of hellfire more than he invited people to come into eternity in heaven. As a matter of fact, most of what we know about hell comes from the words of Jesus. He's the one that gives us insight and understanding into what hell is all about. The apostles in the early church believed in hell. Protestants and Catholics, Orthodox churches have all historically agreed on the reality of a place that is called hell where people will, who have rejected Christ, spend eternity. When we read our text in Luke 16, most commentaries suggests that the words of Jesus are really a parable. You know what a parable was? It was a story that told a lesson. Most commentators would suggest that this story in Luke 16 is a parable. Let me just mention two or three things to you. These actually, I borrow these from Ray Pritchard. First of all, he notes it is not called a parable. There's nowhere in this narrative that Jesus says this is parabolic teaching. Secondly, he notes that if it is a parable, it is the only parable of Jesus that has a name in it. Jesus begins this story by saying, there was a man by the name of Lazarus. Very clearly, it does not seem illustrative, he is speaking about a person. And then thirdly, Pritchard points out, even if it is a parable, it is not just fanciful truth. Jesus is teaching something very important about the eternal destinies of those who die with and without God. Let me share with you seven things very quickly, and I'll just run through these about the reality of hell. You may want to jot these down if you don't have the notes. They're really very simple, but these are things that, that emerge right out of this text in Luke 16. Number one, whether in the torment of hell or the bliss of heaven, those who have died are still very much alive in eternity. The rich man wants to be where Lazarus is. He sees him. He is alive. He is talking to Abraham. He is not asleep. He is not unconscious. He is very much alive there. 
Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham or in paradise is very much alive as he is able to dip his finger in the water and Lazarus wants him to come and put that water on his tongue to cool him. It could not happen. He lifted up his eyes and saw, the text says, very much alive. Secondly, the dead continue to have their personalities and their personal character. Lazarus and the rich man were still Lazarus and the rich man. They were not changed. Thirdly, both those in heaven and in hell maintain their bodily faculties. They see, they taste, they touch, they recognize, they remember, they reflect. Lazarus in hell remembered that he had five brothers and he knew that unless someone got the message to them, they would end up spending eternity there as well. They beg, they suffer, they think ahead. The rich man did all of those things, but he could not get out. He was trapped. Fourthly, and this is very important, death marks the final separation. What matters, look at me for just a moment, is not what happens to you after you die, but what you do before you die. Because death is the final separation. It is at death. After this, the judgment. It is after death that the final decision is made. It's too late after death. And so death marks the final separation. That's not the important piece. The important piece is what one does prior to death. This determines our eternal destiny. Number five, the dead cannot communicate with the living. It is not a possibility that, 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 Lazarus, or the, that Lazarus could go and speak to the brothers of the rich man. That was not allowed. There can be no commu communication, the dead with the living. Number six, hell is a place of personal suffering three times. Jesus mentions torment, agony, and suffering. And number seven, the damned beg for help that does not come. He knew that his brother still had a chance. He wanted someone to help them. But Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets. If they won't listen to that, they won't listen to anyone. Hell is a reality that the church can ill afford to gloss over and quit talking about. It's not pleasant, but we owe it to the world to preach the gospel and the truth of God's word. Say amen if you believe that this morning. Francis Chan says, deep down in the heart of every person is a desire to reinterpret Jesus in light of our own culture, our own political bent, or our favorite theological belief. He says, we do the same thing with hell. The question, what is hell, has spawned many answers over the years. For origin, hell was a place where the souls of the wicked were purified so they could find their way back to God. Dante depicted hell as a place under the earth's surface and with nine levels of suffering where sinners were bitten by snakes, tormented by beasts, showered with icy rain and trapped in rivers of blood or flaming tombs. Some were even steeped in the hu human pools of huge pools of human excrement. C.S. Lewis' portrayal of hell was significantly less creepy. For Lewis, it was kind of like a dark, gloomy city or a place where being fades into non-entity. A happier portrait of hell was painted by the band ACDC, who said, hell ain't a bad place to be. It's where all our friends are. And most recently, Rob Bell said that hell is not about someday somewhere else, but about the various hells on earth that people experience in this life, genocide, rape, and unjust socioeconomic structures. Look at me for just a moment. You can try to be like one of those people and reinterpret hell if you'd like. You can, you can reinterpret hell after your imagination and what makes you comfortable, but if you're going to be a person of the word and a person of the book, Hell is real. It's not something we lovingly and excitedly embrace. But hell is real. And it is our responsibility to speak 
to its reality. Secondly, let me talk about the eternality of hell. It is a place that continues on for eternity. There are those that say hell is temporary, that it only lasts for a season. It is not forever. It is not for eternity. Some believe in a second chance. That is, once in hell, that there will be someone that will come and preach in some way, and there will be a chance to respond to the gospel after the fact. We know that the Catholics have taught not forever, but for some time, the doctrine of purgatory, where you can just spend a little time there and then get prayed out of that. That's not something that has been part of classical Catholic doctrine forever. People don't understand that. That's something that was added hundreds of years later and nowhere in the scripture, but they believe that there is a way to be prayed out of that. There are others that believe, and this may be the most common, and this is certainly has a lot of steam in the evangelical world, and that is they believe in annihilation. That is that the good, the godly, go to heaven, and the wicked simply are annihilated. They just cease to be. The torment does not last forever. People who believe this way generally say it's immoral for someone to spend eternity suffering. They feel like it is vindictive of God to make someone spend eternity in hell. And they say that it is not compatible with modern thinking. Another one that has certainly picked up steam and is certainly popular among many evangelicals is universalism. This is the doctrine that was touted by Rob Bell that we talked about just last week. Rob Bell, a very popular evangelical, had a great following, so gifted and so talented, but began to sway from truth and biblical doctrine. And he now espouses what is called universalism, and he writes this, at the heart of this perspective is the belief that given enough time, everyone will turn to God and find themselves in the joy and peace of God's presence. The love of God will melt every hard heart, and even the most depraved sinners will eventually give up the resistance and turn to God. What a nice thing that would be if that's true, but it is not the witness of Scripture. Anything beyond the Word of God is speculative. The Bible uses terms like smoke and fire and burning and torment and the bottomless pit and everlasting punishment, prison, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, unquenchable fire, eternal fire, damnation, burning sulfur. Never does the Bible use a word that even remotely resembles annihilation. Consider the words of Jesus. These are tough words. And these will go away into, look at the word everlasting punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. The word everlasting and eternal, the words everlasting and eternal are identical Greek words. The Greek word is a, aoneos, aoneos. And it means without beginning and without end, never ceasing. So Jesus is saying, and these will go away into aoneos punishment, punishment that never ends, is without beginning and without end, but the righteous will go into eternal or aoneos life, without beginning and without end, never ceasing. Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. And look at what he writes, where the worm does not die and the fire is not, and the fire is unquenchable. It's ongoing. And certainly John the Revelator says the same thing. Look at the witness of Revelation. I saw a great white throne, and who, him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The witness of scripture is that hell is both real and hell is eternal. Before I give you the third point, look right here for just a moment. Can I just tell you very pastorally, um, I, I have read arguments. There are those who have tried to make arguments from scripture that, that hell really does not exist or that it is annihilation or that there is a second chance. They have used Greek words and try to make them mean something that, that would rid us of the doctrine of hell. I understand that for modern thinkers and those who are learned and those who are educated, this seems to be beyond the realm of possibility. I've looked at all of those arguments. I've considered them. I've studied them. And I can just tell you the witness of Scripture, like it or not, is that there is a real and eternal hell that those who reject Jesus Christ will find themselves spending eternity in. And let me lead you to the third and final point, and that is the necessity of hell. Because if God is love, one would ask, why do we even have a hell? If God is a loving God that desires that none perish, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, but all come to repentance... If God gave his son to die for the sake of all humanity, won't God make sure that everyone ultimately goes to heaven? If you want the answer of the progressive or the liberal or those who want to think in a modern way, who want to be accountable to no one, their answer is yes, God will find a way. If you want the answer of scripture, the answer is no. Why is hell necessary? Let me share with you four or five reasons. Number one, there must be a reward for virtue and there must be a punishment for evil. Civilizations that have no law are absolutely chaotic. You remove laws today and you do not punish or give consequences to wickedness, it is chaos, it is anarchy. When we don't reward obedience and we do not bring consequences to the disobedient, we have an absolute mess on our hands. We used to say there was a heaven to gain. That used to be a, a line. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. You don't hear that any longer because we don't want to deal with that reality. We live in a world that is upside down. I preached about that. Amos said, we live in a day when... That which is right is wrong, and that which is wrong is right. That which is evil is good, and that which is good is evil. And certainly, our culture does not want to embrace or accept this doctrine, but there must be a reward for virtue and a punishment for evil. Secondly, may I suggest to you that ultimate justice cannot exist without hell. The evil of this world, the rapist, the child abuser, those who abduct others, murdering tyrants. Some of those have even gotten away with it in this life. And there seems to be no settling of the score. There has to be a hell to deal the blow of ultimate and final justice. Many of you have watched as people who have lived wickedly seem to prosper and do better than you do. And, and it's a frustrating thing, but heaven and hell meet out the final justice of God. Ultimate justice cannot exist without a hell. Thirdly, hell must exist for unrepentant sinners. If there is no hell, the only place unrepentant sinners would go would be heaven, and they cannot go there if they hate and reject Jesus. They would not feel at home in a place like heaven. Number four, we could not fully appreciate our salvation without it. What have we been saved from? We could not fully appreciate that, which leads me to number five, and this to me is the most compelling argument. Hell is necessary for the glory of God to be seen. 
to be able to witness his justice and his righteousness and his holiness could not happen without the reality of hell. J.I. Packer, one of the greatest writers, you need to read Packer if you get a chance. I've read his book, Knowing God, and this comes from that book, Knowing God. I've read it several times, but he says this, God is not just unless he inflicts upon all sin and wrongdoing the penalty it deserves. While we may think it severe, we desperately need God's wrath. It is a holy and just response to evil to restore the broken world in which we live. Francis Chan was traveling on a weeknight. It was a Wednesday night, and Chan is known in the evangelical church everywhere he goes. He's a popular speaker, always has huge crowds. But he wanted to go to a church somewhere. He just wanted to be in church where he wouldn't be noticed. And so one Wednesday night, he went into a very little small country church. They were so small, they had no musicians on the platform. And and they were still singing a cappella. And Chan said he doesn't have a very good voice himself, but he felt pretty good when he heard some of the people singing around him because they were worse than him. But as he was visiting this small church with no instruments, he heard these words of that song that we often sing in Christ alone. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Let, let me pause for just a moment and just do a quick little doctrinal teaching. You know what happened to Calvary? Romans chapter 1 says that God unleashed all of his wrath on ungodliness. He unleashed all of his wrath. The penalty for sin was unleashed on the Son of God. As Jesus hung on the cross, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How many are thankful for that? He did that for us. Jesus said in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What an ugly picture of Jesus, the Son of Man being typified by a serpent. Why is that the case? Because on the cross... Jesus didn't just bear your sin. He didn't just shoulder my sin. He became sin. And he took the wrath of God. And he experienced separation from the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took that for you and me so that God's justice could be satisfied. God is a just God, and sin had to be penalized. And so now all who place their faith in Jesus stand as we learned a few weeks ago, 10 feet tall, perfect in Christ. But those who reject him stand on their own merits. Chan writes, while hell can be a paralyzing doctrine, it can also be an energizing one. For it magnifies the beauty of the cross. Hell is the backdrop that reveals the profound and unbelievable grace of the cross. It brings to light the enormity of our sin and therefore portrays the undeserved favor of God in full color. Christ freely chose to bear the wrath that I deserve so that I can experience life in the presence of God. How can I keep from singing, crying, and proclaiming the indescribable love of God? Hell re reveals the glory of God, for in hell we recognize what we were saved from. Why don't you stand with me if you would. Don't leave, just stand. Give me four more minutes if you would. Listen to me, just focus in this morning. Hell is real. Hell is eternal. Hell is necessary. I just tell you, I would be a whole lot more popular without preaching on hell, and I'd be a whole lot more comfortable, and I'd sweat a whole lot less if I didn't have to preach on it. But I would not be doing what God had called me to do. I would not be a faithful shepherd or pastor. If I just glossed that over and made everybody feel like it's just wonderful, and one day we're all going to go to heaven, that would be unfaithfulness, and I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. R.C. Sproul was asked about the language of Scripture when it describes hell, and 
They said, isn't some of the language of hell symbolic? And Sproul said, yes, it is. And he went on to say, but remember if it is symbolic, it's symbolic because the reality is too awful for words. It's not better than this, it's worse. Whatever hell is, it will be so bad that people in hell will pray for fire and brimstone as relief. I asked myself this question when I prepared this sermon. Is there any good news in this sermon? I've given you some pretty bad news for the last 30 minutes. Is there any good news? And the answer is yes, this is the gospel. There is good news. The good news is that no one has to go to hell. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Whosoever shall believe, but they will have everlasting life. Every one of us could say, but God, personally, I should go to hell. God, that really is where I belong, but Jesus took my place. And I can tell you, look at me for just a moment. I know and you can know for certain that you are on your way to heaven because Jesus took hell for you if you take or place your faith in him. Jesus did all he could do to make it hard to go to hell. Realize that hell is the default. Hell is the default. If you do nothing, if you don't place your faith in Christ, hell is the default. Jesus made a way for all of us to spend eternity with him. Let me just ask you this question. What, what should make our hearts ache when we think about the reality of hell? Can I tell you, I, uh, I came to this conclusion, it bothered me that Many times, my life shows little evidence that I believe in hell. When I think about unbelievers, I can very easily brush those thoughts away so it doesn't ruin my day. I can just go on with my life and enjoy and not really be moved by that. But there is a reality we must not ignore. Talking about a hypothetical person is one thing, but what about your family members? What about your neighbors? What about those you work with? What about your best friend that doesn't know Christ? What about those you go to school with? When people say, do you think I'm going to go to hell? Do we react almost allergically and say, no, there's no such place? New Testament writers did not have an allergic reaction. They didn't try to make God fit in their small ideals. Hell is real. And the apostle Paul said, Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Let me close with this story. If you ever watched the movie or read the book, The End of the Spear, it tells the true story of five missionaries who gave their lives to reach the violence of the Adoni tribe in the jungles of Ecuador in the 1950s. Nate Saint actually led that missionary team, and they were eager to preach and evangelize and win to Christ the Wadoni tribe before they all died off from their internal conflict and their civil war. As Nate Saint was preparing for his adventure, his family was gathered around him on the dirt road or the dirt airstrip in front of their house. He kissed his wife goodbye and Steve, his son, looked in to the back of his dad's plane and he noticed among the gear in the plane, he noticed his dad's rifle and obviously he worried and he turned to his father and he said, if the Wadoni attack you, dad, will you use your guns? Will you defend yourselves? And Nate Saint looked his boy dead in the eye and responded, son, we cannot shoot the Wadoni. They're not ready for heaven. But we are. That's how passionate he was about lost people. I pray that God would stir our hearts we would recognize the reality of both heaven and hell, but we would not easily get away from the reality of hell. We would say, God, stir our hearts. Bow your heads with me if you would. I want to ask two questions before we go this morning. First of all, let me talk to those of you maybe who have never committed your life 
to Jesus Christ. There may be those in this room who you're good people. Maybe you're faithful church members. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've never done anything on a grand scale that seems all that bad. But the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart today and reminding you that unless you place your faith in Jesus, you have a default to eternity and it's not eternity with Jesus. And you would just simply say by an upraised hand, Pastor Kevin, would you pray for me today? I'd like to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to know before I leave this place today, I want to know for certain that I place my faith in what Jesus did on the cross and I want to know for certain that my eternity is going to be with him. Is there anyone in this room that would raise a hand and say, would you pray for me? I don't want to leave this building without knowing for sure that my heart is right with Christ. Anyone that would slip up a hand, I'd love to pray with you. Anyone in this place, anyone in this room, let me ask a second question then. How many with your head still bowed would say, Pastor Kevin, I know that heaven and hell are reality. And honestly, my heart has not been stirred like it needs to have been stirred over these last months or years, maybe never in my life, to accept the reality of a hell that I have a responsibility to do my best to save people from. And today I want to commit myself by an upraised hand to saying, God, stir my heart. I want to give more faithfully to those who are going to share the gospel. I want to share the gospel. I want to share. I want to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within me. I want to be ready to give a witness to the gospel of Jesus. I want God to use me so that friends and family members, co-workers can know Christ and can be assured of an eternity with Jesus. How many would raise their hand and say, that is the desire of my heart. God, stir my heart so that I can more faithfully share your word. Father, today I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that um, your grace was demonstrated to us and that while we were still sinners, you died for us. What a difficult subject it is when we talk about the reality that friends and loved ones may miss out on eternal life and may instead experience eternal damnation. But Lord, you've made a way and you've called us to walk in obedience to that way share your love with others. So stir our hearts to witness, to intercede, to pray for the lost, to give so that others might come to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord together. Are you hurting and broken within?
another just a reminder, Sarah will be out at the table. Um, the one of the missionary that spoke today, she'll be out at her table greeting you. Stop by, pick up a prayer card and see her and just wish her well. Thank you so much. Have a great day.